All right. Review of trace functions. Just the basics, and then we have two more days to talk about uh, solving trigonometric equations and graphing trigonometric functions. Today's mostly definitions and making sure you have that unit circle um, firmly on the back of your eyelids so that when you close your eyes at night, you see the unit circle. That's what I'm going for right here. I think that's what I'm going to do. I do. I hope so. I hope. I hope that you don't say I've never seen the unit circle before, but if I have, if, if, if that is the truth, then I'm just going to have to make you more videos. All right. Uh, oh, we love it. Yay, wonderful. Wonderful. All right, glad to hear it. Okay, well, this is just review for you. Hopefully it bores you. That's that's the goal here. It's, I've seen this before. In. In trigonometry, we define um, an angle as a rotation of an initial side of an angle through the unit circle. All right, so any angle has an initial side. I need to point over here if it's recording. Um, an initial side, and then you rotate that initial side either counterclockwise or clockwise around the around the circle and. Um, where you stop is called the terminal ray, and where those two rays meet is called the vertex. So in this case, this is some angle theta that's formed by that initial ray and that terminal ray. The three parts of an angle are the initial ray, the terminal ray, and the vertex. If the, if the initial ray is coinciding with the x-axis, if the vertex is at the origin, in other words, if this is my y-axis and this is my x-axis and that initial side is on the x-axis with the vertex at zero, then that angle is said to be in standard position. Standard position of an angle. And you know from, gosh, third, fourth, fifth grade somewhere that angles between zero and 90 degrees are acute angles between 90 and 180 degrees are obtuse. You need to know that any angle that is started by, or that is formed by starting with the initial side and rotating it counterclockwise through the coordinate system is a positive angle. So positive angles rotate the initial ray counterclockwise and negative angles are formed when you um, rotate that initial ray clockwise. So if we're going in this direction, a negative angle is formed. If we're going in this direction, a positive angle is formed. Two angles that have the same initial side and the same terminal side are called coterminal angles. You can spin around that circle infinitely many times and stop at this same terminal side every time. So if that say is, I don't know, any, many, many, mo, maybe 45 degrees, then if you go around that circle again and stop at, where would you have to stop to be at 445 degrees? You went 45 and then another 360. That's a 405, a 405 degree angle is coterminal with a 45 degree angle because they, that terminal side is in the same place. So um, the figures D.25 and D.26 show you um, here a negative angle of 45 degrees. If you start on the positive X axis and go 45 degrees clockwise, that's a negative 45 degree angle. That's coterminal with a positive 315 degree angle. Because if you started in standard position and went 315 degrees in the positive direction, you'd have the same terminal side. Uh, D.26 shows you a, whoa, that is a 45 degree angle. And then if you go around the circle again, a 405 degree angle would be coterminal with a 45 degree angle. Hey, um, Mr. Dillon. 
finally get through that hang up? Yeah. Let me give you the two things that you missed and get somebody to tell you what I said about this log rhythm packet. There you go. All right. So we understand what um, we understand what the parts of an angle are: the initial ray, the terminal ray, the vertex. We understand standard form is just the initial side coinciding with the positive x-axis and vertex of the origin. We already knew acute and obtuse angles, coterminal angles, just angles that have the same terminal side. So for example, that homework that I copied for you, page D25, Numbers one and two say determine two coterminal angles, one positive and one negative. And number two, part A, gives us a 300 degree angle. If we started on the positive x axis and rotated 300 degrees, in what quadrant would the terminal side of that angle lie? We went 300 degrees. This would be, I've got to remember to over here. Um, this would be 90 degrees, 180 degrees, 270 degrees, so 300 degrees would be just a little bit past that. That's 300 degrees. Now if we want a positive coterminal angle, how could we get another angle whose terminal side would lie right there in the fourth quadrant? Just add 360 degrees. Just go around the circle another time. So a positive coterminal angle would be that 300 degrees plus another 360 degrees or a 660 degree angle would be coterminal. What about a negative coterminal angle? What could I do to get a negative angle that had the same terminal side in the fourth quadrant. Just subtract 360. Go the other direction. Take the 300 degrees minus 360 is negative 60 degrees. So we have a positive and a negative coterminal angle. I'm not going to do the B part because it would be the same thing. You have a negative 420 degree angle. Hey, if you added I won't write it down, but let me mention this. If you added 360 degrees to that, you still have a negative coterminal angle. Your negative coterminal angle could be negative 60. Now, the direction say answers may vary because there are infinitely many coterminal angles. But if you added 360, you'd get one of the negative coterminal angles, negative 60. How could you get a positive coterminal angle then? You'd have to add another 360 or add 720 to that negative 420, and then you get a positive coterminal angle. So that's pretty easy. Um, let's talk about radian measure. Degrees are one way that angles are measured, but there's another way that we're gonna use almost exclusive in calculus. In calculus, we're not gonna talk about angles measured in degrees, we're gonna talk about angles measured in radians. Now, um, you had a great trick teacher, does radian kind of click? If you take the radius of a circle, whatever it is, and I meant to bring a little piece of string in here with me, but I forgot. Um, if I take the radius of a circle, let's say the radius is from here to here, whatever that is. If I had a piece of string that long and I laid it off on a circle, I put a piece here, and a piece here, and a piece here, and a piece here. I need to know how many times that piece of string could be laid off around that circle. If I had the piece of string, it'd be easier to show you. But, and also, that's not a perfect circle. But if I took a piece of string this long and laid it off on the circumference of that circle, how many times would a piece of string we call this radius R. How many times would a string of length R go around that circle? It 
it's darn close to six. If, if folks who don't know it's too high, it's darn close to six. It's a little more than six times. And then when you start thinking about the formula for circumference of a circle, circumference is two pi times the radius. So that radius would go around the circle two pi times. Now the actual definition of radians is on page D to 18. The definition of radian is right here. The radian measure of theta is defined to be the length of the arc of the sector. That's not quite worded as well as it is in my pre-calculus book. Let me read that first sentence. To assign a radian measure to an angle theta, consider theta to be the central angle of a circle of radius one. Hmm. Yeah, I don't like their definition. Let me kind of, let me put it in the words of the pre-calculus book. I think it's better. If you form this central angle by taking the length of the radius and laying it off on the circumference of that circle one time, then the, the, the radian measure of that angle is one radian. If theta is one radian, All that means is that the arc length of that um, piece of the circle is equivalent to one radius. And so, if I say, how many radians would it take to go around that circle one complete time, well, we know it takes 360 degrees to go around that circle one complete time. It takes two pi radians. To go around that circle one complete time. 360 degrees is one complete revolution of the unit circle. Two pi radians is one complete revolution of the unit circle. So if 360 degrees is two pi radians, and that's one complete revolution, if we just go around the circle halfway instead of all the way, that's 180 degrees. That's just one pi radians. And if we only go half of that half, that's 45 degrees, and 45 degrees is a quarter pi radians. So if I give you any number of degrees and ask you to change it to radians, you can do that. The easiest way is just by unit canceling. This verdict, the, um, the pre-calculus book says to go one way, you multiply by pi over 180. To go another way, you multiply by 180 over pi. If, when I just memorize stuff that doesn't make sense to me, it's gone the next day. I've got to make it make sense or it won't stick with me. So instead of trying to remember which one do you multiply by pi over 180 and which one do you multiply by 180 over pi, I use unit canceling just like this book shows. In the A part, if you want to convert 40 degrees to radians, um, let me say one other thing right here. If 360 degrees is two pi radians, then 180 degrees is one pi radians. So if I want to convert 40 degrees to radians, I put 40 degrees over one, and I need to multiply it by a fraction that has degrees in the denominator and radians in the numerator. I want my degrees to cancel and be left with radians. So I know that this unit fraction I need to multiply by is 
pi radians is the same as 180 degrees. That fraction is equivalent to one. So I'm really just multiplying a fraction by one. You know multiplying a fraction by one doesn't really change it. It gives you an equivalent fraction. So to change degrees to radians, put the degrees over one, 40 degrees over one, multiply by something that has degrees in the denominator, radians in the numerator, and then just reduce your fraction. That fraction reduces to two pi radians. So two ninths pi radians. 40 degrees is the same as two ninths pi radians. And if you give me radians, such as negative pi over two radians, I put negative pi over two radians over one. And then the unit fraction that I multiply by has to have radians in the denominator, if I want to cancel the radians, has to have degrees in the numerator, if I want to be left with degrees. So the unit fraction I multiply by is 180 degrees is the same thing as pi radians then exactly what I want to cancel cancels. Exactly what I want to be left with is what I'm left with. Negative pi over two radians is the same as negative 90 degrees. So that's how you go back and forth between degrees and radians. The calculus almost exclusively uses radians, so that's what you need to get really comfortable with. All right. Definitions of trigonometric functions are on the next page. When we first used trigonometric functions, we just talked about a right triangle. We defined the six trigonometric functions as ratios of sizes of, of a right triangle. And you pretty much, much just memorize that if you have a uh, Right triangle, you can label at any degree, any angle named theta. With respect to that angle, there's an opposite side, a side opposite theta, there's an adjacent side, the side touching theta, and then of course any right triangle, the side opposite the right angle is a hypotenuse. So given those three sides, opposite, adjacent, and hypotenuse, you can form the six trigonometric functions with these definitions. Sine of theta is the ratio of the opposite side to the hypotenuse. Cosine of theta is the, is the ratio of the adjacent side to the hypotenuse. Tangent is the ratio of the opposite side to the adjacent side. Did y'all have a corny little something that helped you remember that? Sokotoa. Yeah. Good old Sokotoa. Sine is opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse. Tangent is opposite over adjacent. It's actually harder for me to remember how to spell Sokotoa than it is just to memorize these six definitions, but whatever works for you is okay. Now, um, in the homework, Number 16, number 16 gives us a triangle. And all we know about that triangle is sine of theta is one third. Now the triangle that we're given looks like this. It has the hypotenuse being three and this side being one. It's very important to know which one of your two acute angles is theta. If this is theta up here, then one's the adjacent side. But if this is theta down here, then one is the opposite side. You have to label theta before you can determine which is the opposite and which is the adjacent. So in the book, this is labeled as theta and one is the opposite side. Now tell me what tool for math I have for finding the missing side of a right triangle. The Pythagorean theorem. If a squared plus b squared equals c squared, 
Is that three A, B, or C? C is always the hypotenuse. Any, many, mighty, mo, it doesn't matter whether you call the one A or B. If we call it B, then we'll have A squared plus one squared equals three squared. Three squared is nine. I'm gonna be lazy, skip some steps here. Subtract one from both sides. Nine minus one is eight. So what is A? Square root of eight, which simplifies to two square root of two. All right, we've used no tricks so far. We just used the Pythagorean theorem to find the uh, adjacent side of theta. Now, actually, number 16 is only asking us for tangent theta, but if it did ask us for cosine theta, what would it be? Cosine is adjacent over hypotenuse, two square root of two over three. And how do you get tangent theta? Opposite over adjacent, the side opposite theta is one. The side adjacent to theta is two square root of two. But no self-respecting math teacher or math student is gonna leave an answer one over two square root of two because why? We don't leave radicals in the denominator. Now that rule actually, or that practice, came from during the day, Mr. Grease's days, I suppose. Mr. Grease uh, did his math before calculators were invented, and he did his calculations on a slide rule. With a slide rule, you could, from what I understand, I'm not as old as Mr. Grease, in case you didn't know. Um, from what I understand, though, you couldn't calculate this value with a radical in the denominator on a slide rule. On a calculator, it's no problem. You can punch that on the calculator and get a decimal approximation, but apparently you could do it with a slide rule, and that's why back in the day, we never left a radical in the denominator. We just never got away from that because that's how the answers are written in the back of the book. In the back of the book, you can't leave a radical in the denominator. So multiply that by square root of two over square root of two to rationalize the denominator. The numerator is just square root of two. What's the denominator? Four. Because this square root of two times that square root of two is just two. And then you have times the coefficient two. So tangent theta would be square root of two over four. Um, what about cosecant theta? What would cosecant theta be? Not the opposite, but what's that other, what's that line where is it? Reciprocal. Opposite means change the sign, and that's not what we're talking about. But the reciprocal of sign would be 3 over 1, or just 3. What is secant theta? The reciprocal of cosine. And again, I'm pretty sure that's not the answer in the back of the book, because they're going to rationalize the denominator. 3 square root of 2 over 4. What's the reciprocal of tangent called? Cotangent? Cotangent theta. You, you could take this square root of 2 over 4, flip it, and then rationalize it, or you can look what tangent was to begin with, 1 over 2 square root of 2, and just flip that. The reciprocal of tangent would be, just be two square root of two. All right, I was gonna do number 18, but time flies when we just got an hour and I trust you when you say, yeah, I'm pretty good at this. I'm, I'm okay with this. I had a great trigonometry teacher, so that's wonderful. All right, <clears throat> at the bottom of page D19, let me just tell you which of those identities are most important for you to know. I certainly don't have the whole bottom page of that memorized. I couldn't tell you all my half angle formulas and, and double angle formulas and the sum formulas and the product formulas. I don't have those in my head. If you need one of those, 
in calculus, I'm going to give it to you in the problem because, honest to goodness, if you were working and you needed that formula, you'd Google it, right? you got plenty to memorize in calculus without having to memorize all the sum and product and half angle and double angle formulas. What you do use enough that you need to just have it on the tip of your tongue, Pythagorean identities. I would definitely make sure that I knew those. Sine squared plus cosine squared is one. Tangent squared plus one is secant squared. Cotangent squared plus one is, cos is cosecant squared. Um, I don't have memorized my sum or difference formulas. I don't I have the law of cosines memorized, but I don't need it very often in at least Cal 1. Um, reciprocal identities, that's just kind of the definition of cosecant, secant, and cotangent. So I don't even consider that as being something different to memorize. And the same thing for the quotient identities. I know that tangent is sine over cosine and cotangent is cosine over sine. The only other thing that I see enough in calculus just to have it memorized, I can remember that sine of two theta is two th sine theta cosine theta. Don't worry about the rest of that page. If you need to get anything from the rest of that page on the test, I will give it to you. Yes, sir. Absolutely, absolutely, and dang it, if I had time, it's so cool. That's great, and I have to do that a lot because, like I said, anything that I memorize that I don't understand, I don't, it doesn't make sense to me, it's liable to go away, and I will have to recreate it. But I use the Pythagorean identities frequently enough just to get them memorized without having to recreate them every time. Absolutely, absolutely. The proof to the Pythagorean identities is using the Pythagorean theorem and a right triangle labeled opposite of adjacent hypotenuse. All right, so I just wanted to show you that so you didn't worry about what all of those do I need to have memorized. The next big thing on the outline, we've talked about the um, definition of the trigonometric function using right triangles. But after we talked about those defini definitions using opposite adjacent and hypotenuse, we moved from talking about trigonometric functions of triangles to trigonometric functions of angles of a circle, a circle with radius r. And actually that's on page D219 as well. Here's our um, right triangle, and then here is some circle with radius r. If you have a circle with radius r, you can drop a vertical, well, depending on where the um, terminal side of that angle is, you can either drop a vertical down to the x-axis, or if your terminal side is in the third or fourth quadrant, you raise a vertical line up to the x-axis. Just draw a vertical line to the nearest x-axis. If I give you that a point on the terminal side of that circle is x, y, that means this horizontal distance is x, this vertical distance is y, and we'll just call the hypotenuse r because it's the radius of the circle. If we label our angle in that way, then we can use the same um, definitions for the trigonometric functions that we used here. If this is our angle we're talking about, let's call that little angle um, let's see. If I do that, it'll be worded differently than here. Um, Without going into why, eh, I don't even want to finish that sentence. Um, if we're talking about this little angle here, then the sine of that little angle would be the opposite over the hypotenuse y over r. The cosine of that angle would be adjacent over hypotenuse, which would be x over r. And the tangent of that angle would be 
opposite over adjacent, which is y over x. That's these definitions of the six trigonometric functions for a, rate, a circle of any radius. We're not talking about the unit circle right now. We're talking about the circle of the, a circle with any radius. So we have one of those. Um, I'm trying to do an example just like every problem in the homework. We have one of those, number 12. And we'll just do the A part. We have a circle. And all we're given is that the point 8, negative 15 is on the circumference of that circle. If we, since we're in the fourth quadrant, if we raise a vertical line up to the nearest x-axis, we have formed a triangle with this angle being theta. That gives us everything we need to find the sine of theta, the cosine of theta, the tangent of theta, and the other three. Um, what is this? horizontal distance, this adjacent side. If that's the point 8, negative 15, we went over 8 units to get to it. This is 8. What's this opposite side, the length of that opposite side? Technically, if I say what's the distance, distance can't be negative, right? So if I say what's the distance, the distance is 15. It's technically not correct to label the side of a triangle negative 15 because the triangle can't have a link, a leg of length negative 15. But since this is in the fourth quadrant and I don't want to lose my negative, I'm going to put the negative there anyway. And how would I find the um, hypotenuse? Pythagorean theorem. Which I'm not going to write all the way out. That's another thing you need to get to where you can do in your head. Find the missing side of a right triangle without having to write down a squared plus b squared plus c squared. Here, since I have both legs, the hypotenuse would be the square root of 8 squared is 64, 15 squared is 225, 64 and 225 is 289, square root of 289 is it's okay. I love that so many of you answered, but if you were a person thinking, holy cow, I can't do that, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I just want you to know what to punch on the calculator. What you punch on the calculator is 8 squared plus negative 15 squared, and then get equals, take the square root of that, but it would turn out to be 17. I just recognize 8, 15, 17 as a Pythagorean triple. All right, so what is um, sine of theta? Here's theta. Sine of theta would be what? 15 over 17. Opposite over hypotenuse is negative 15 over 17. What's cosine of theta? Adjacent over hypotenuse is 8 over 17. What's tangent theta? Opposite over adjacent is negative 15 over 8. And then, just to save time, I'm not even going to write down the other three. But you know how to find cosecant, secant, and cotangent once you have those three. All right, so we have the definition of the trigonometric functions using a triangle. And we have the definition of the trigonometric functions using a circle of any radius r. What if we kind of standardized it and said, we're only going to talk about circles of radius 1. That's the unit circle. The unit circle is centered at the origin, and it has a radius of 1. So. The unit circle is what we're going to use to find exact trigonometric values of 
any angle that we have memorized on the unit circle, um, any angle that we don't have memorized on the unit circle. Sometimes we can use a double angle formula or a half angle formula. Most of the time we just use a decimal approximation on the calculator. So again, read the direction. See if the direction say find the exact answer. If it says find the exact answer, then I want square root two over two or square root three over two. I want the exact answer. I say find a decimal approximation, then I'll tell you what to round it to. Let's think about this unit circle that I gave you on the back of this outline. This is what you need to have tattooed on your eyelid. Oh yeah. <laughs> Tonight, I haven't yet met a mom who disapproved of a tattoo on the eyelid, inner eyelid, because it doesn't show. Nobody, nobody can see on the inner eyelid, so you can see it when you close your eyes. Yeah, yeah, you can do that. It's like a projector screen. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I see when I close my eyes. I'm sorry. Um, this is my x-axis and this is my y-axis. By the way, I think highlighters are a fabulous thing to always bring to class with you. That's my x-axis and that's my y-axis. All right. If the term, if the initial side of my triangle is on the x-axis and the terminal side is in the same place, I really haven't gone anywhere. That's zero degrees. How many radians is zero degrees? Zero. zero degrees is still zero radians. And by the way, um, when the angles are measured in degrees, the degree symbol will be written. But when angles are measured in radians, there's no units written. When there are no units written, it's understood to be radians. So you wouldn't see in a book zero radians, you just see zero, and you know that means zero radians. That happens to be the same as if we went all the way around the circle, that's 360 degrees, which is how many radians? Two pi radians. And I'm not gonna write radians, I'm just gonna write two pi. If all the way around the circle is 360 degrees, then halfway around the circle is 180 degrees. And if all the way around the circle is 2 pi radians, what's the radian measure if you just go halfway around the circle? 1 pi radians, or just pi. And if 180 degrees is pi radians, what's 90 degrees? And what would 270 degrees be? If we're counting by halves, this is one half, two halves, three halves. And then if we continue another 90 degrees, we're to four halves or two pi radians. What would be the degree measure of an angle that bisected the first quadrant, halfway between here and here? That's a 45 degree angle. And if it's halfway between zero radians and pi over two radians, what's halfway between zero and pi over two? Pi over four. Now what you're going to get really good at doing, the kind of thing of that picture on the back of your eyelid, you're not going to have to draw the unit circle every time you take a test. That, that will take you too long. Um, you're going to learn to count by quarter tops. You're going to say one fourth, two fourths, three fourths, four fourths. Double check, four fourths is one. And then five fourths, six fourths, reduces to three halves. <coughs> Seven fourths, eight fourths, reduces to two pi. Let me label those. Here's one fourth. Two fourths is the same thing as a half. Here's three fourths <coughs> pi. Four fourths is the same as one pi. Five fourths pi. 
Another fourth would get me to six fourths, which is three halves. Another 45 degrees would give me to seven fourths pi. And another 45 degrees would get me to eight fourths, which reduces to two pi. Get really good at going. One fourth, two fourths, three fourths, four fourths, five fourths, six fourths, seven fourths, eight fourths. The other angles that we use so frequently, might as well add them to the tattoo, are multiples of 30 degrees. Now, if this is 30 degrees, and it's one third of the way to 90 degrees, what's one third of pi over two? Pi over six. Not only am I gonna get good at counting by pi over fours, I'm gonna get good at counting by pi over sixes. This is one six, so 60 degrees would be two six, better known as one third pi or pi over three. There's one six, two six, three six. I'm just double checking myself. Three six reduced to a half, so I know I'm on track. Four six or um, 120 degrees would be what? Four six reduces to? Two thirds pi. Another six, this is four six, so this would be five six pi is 150 degrees. And then six six pi is the same as one pi. And then seven six pi is 210 degrees. Two hundred and forty degrees. If this is seven six, then this is eight six, which reduces to four thirds pi. That's eight six. So this is nine six. Nine six reduces to three halves, so I'm still on track. Another thirty degrees would be three hundred degrees. Another, if this is nine six, then this is. 10 six, which reduces to 5 thirds pi. Another 30 degrees would get us to 330 degrees. If this one is 10 six, then that's what? 11 six pi. And then one more six would be 12 six, and we're back to two pi. So again, you're not gonna have to draw the whole darn unit circle before you start a calculus test. You're just gonna get good at going in your head, one, six, two, six, three, six, four, six, five, six, six, six. Stop and make sure you're horizontal at that point. Seven, six, eight, six, nine, six. Stop and make sure you're vertical at that point. 10, six, 11, six, 12 cents, six. Make sure you're back horizontal at that point. What about the ordered pairs? If this is a unit circle, then what is this um, ordered pair? If this is the unit circle, then this radian, this radius is one, and that's the point when x is one, y is zero, because it's right there on the x-axis. What's this point on the y-axis? The positive y-axis. 0, 1. What's this point on the negative x-axis? Negative 1, 0. And what's this point on the negative y-axis? 0, negative 1. Those are all easy to label. I know that for these other three angles in the first quadrant, my x's are going from one, as I move through the first quadrant, my x's are going from one to zero. My x's are getting smaller and my y's are getting bigger because I'm increasing on that circle. I know that all of the coordinates of these angles for these three angles are either one half, one half, 
square root of 2 over 2 or square root of 3 over 2. I wish we had time to really talk about why, but we're almost out of time already. I just need to figure out which is the X and which is the Y for each of those ordered pairs. You happen to remember the coordinates for square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2? Right here on that circle, this was the line Y equals X, where X and Y are the same thing. So that order of pairs, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 2 over 2. We could find that using a 45 degree uh, right triangle if we, if we had time. And so these other two angles in the first quadrant, I know one of the coordinates is a half, and one of the coordinates is square root of 3 over 2. And back when I took trig, it made no sense. I thought I just had to memorize it. I memorized it and I forgot it. I have to memorize it again and then I forgot it again. And then I finally realized it really does make sense. <laughs> Is at that 30 degree angle, would the X or the Y coordinate be closer to 1? That point right there, would the X or the Y be closer to 1? The X is close to one. The X was one right here. It's just a little bit smaller right here. So the X is the square root of three over two. The Y is a half. And if you look at this distance, that height, no, I'm sorry. If you look at this, um, horizontal distance from the origin to here, that's almost one, that's square root of three over two. If you look at the height at that point, doesn't look like it perfectly on my uh, circle because I, it's not a perfect circle, but if I had done this perfectly, then that would actually look like it crosses the y-axis halfway between zero and one, that's why um, y is a half. At 60 degrees, the y is almost 1. It's the y that's square root of 3 over 2 and the x that's a half. Look what I noticed after years of memorizing and forgetting. Watch my y's decrease. If I call that one, if I call that one um, square root of, yes, yeah, that's what I was trying to think of. I, one is square root of four over two. That makes sense? Square root of four is two, two over two is one. So I can write that square root of four over two. Watch that y or x decrease. Square root of four over two, square root of three over two, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 1 over 2, 0. Did you never realize that was what was happening? Yeah. And my y's are getting bigger. 0, square root of 1 over 2, square root of 2 over 2, square root of 3 over 2, square root of 4 over 2. So that's why I don't have to memorize it anymore. And I can translate if I just if I just have my first quadrant labeled, I can go around the whole unit circle and label all those other points. The coordinates are the same. I just need to affix the prop the proper sign as I G in. In the second quadrant, what's the value of my uh, what's the sign of my x coordinate? Negative, and what's the sign of my y coordinate? Positive. Everywhere in the second quadrant. In the third quadrant, what's the sign of the x coordinate? Negative, and the y? Negative. Negative. And in the fourth quadrant, the sign of the x is positive, positive and y is negative. negative. And of course, in the first quadrant, they're both positive. So if I go around that unit circle, if you just ask me, off the top of my head, 
what's the sine of 5, 6 pi? Here's the middle image I go through real quickly. 5, 6 pi, I go, where is it? 1, 6, 2, 6, 3, 6, 4, 6, 5, 6. And then I'm seeing this. And I think at that point, is it x that's close to negative 1 or is it y that's close to negative 1? This is really close to this. Is it x that's negative 1 or is it y that's close to negative 1? The x is close to negative 1. The x is square root of 3 over 2. The y is a half, except for I know in the second quadrant my x is negative. <coughs> Let's practice this um, using number 20 in the homework. We have seven more minutes. I know I've got to let y'all go at uh, 8.55 so that you have time to get to your 906 class. Yes, ma'am. Oh, there's there's 29 in here. Somebody moved my handicap desk, but I don't have any class with 30 in it, so 29 is okay. They got two classes with 29 in it. All right, negative 30 degrees. Here's the middle image that I have. Negative 30 degrees is just below the x-axis in the fourth quadrant. And I know that in the fourth quadrant, my x's are positive, my y's are negative. The only thing I ask myself is, is this 30 degrees below the x-axis closer to where x is 1 or where y is 1? You're almost back to where x is 1. So x is square root of 3 over 2, and y is a half, only it's negative because it's in the uh, fourth quadrant. Once I get that point labels, I can tell you anything you want to know. I can find the sine of negative 30 degrees is just what? That radius is just 1. So if you say y over the radius, it's just negative 1 half over 1. It's negative 1 half. And what's the cosine of negative 30 degrees? That's x over r, but r is just 1. So cosine of negative 30 degrees is the x coordinate. And how do you get tangent of negative 30 degrees? The y divided by the x. Negative one half divided by square root of three over two. I just hope I get to the point where I don't have to write that down every single time. It's okay if I do, but I'd like to get by without it. That's negative one half times two over square root of three. What's that? Negative one over square root of three because the twos cancel. But that's probably not the answer in the back of the book because they rationalize the denominator. Negative square root of 3 over 3. Um, one more. Let's do. Eh. I'm gonna I'm gonna skip down to 22. The D part. Seventeen pi over three, and I have to figure out where that is on the unit circle. Now, on the unit circle, I don't count by pi over threes. I count by pi over sixes. So, how many sixths is seventeen thirds pi? Just multiply that by two over two, and you get thirty-four. Oops, thirty-four pi over six. So it takes me just a minute until I've practiced it a whole lot. 
to go 162636465666766866966166166. If this is 126 and I went all the way around the circle again, that would be 246. 12 6 pi is the same as 24 6 pi. So I can start counting with 24 6, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 36 would be right here. 31, 32, 33, 34. I'd finally be right there if I went around the circle one time and then another time and then that much more. So all of that's in my head at this point. Because you can't see what is in my head, I write it down for you. But really, if you ask me what's the trigonometric functions of 17 third pi, I wouldn't be writing that down. And I would think at this point right here, is it closer to where x is 1 or to where y is negative 1? It's darn close to where y is negative 1. The y is square root of 3 over 2, and the x is a half except for in the fourth quadrant, my x's are positive, my y's are negative. And once I have that ordered pair, I can give you all six trigonometric functions. All right, the very last thing I wanna mention, I may not even have time to write it down, but to be able to do the homework that I've written down for you, um, the last thing I want to mention is number 14. And we'll just do the A part real quick. All number 14 says is find the quadrant in which theta lies. And I'm told two things about theta. I'm told that the sine of theta is positive and the cosine of theta is negative. In what two quadrants is sine positive? Sine is which one of your coordinates, your x or your y? Your y. So in what two quadrants is sine positive? This could be quadrant one or quadrant two. Cosine is your x. In what two quadrants is your x negative? That could be two or three in which single quadrant is both of those things true. Okay. Right, that's how I'll figure those out. All right, at the bottom of your unit circle, I have written suggested homework. Now if y'all really do all this, I am so impressed and I love you with all my heart. All right, because I know how sucky it is to do math on the homework, unless you're an absolute math nerd like me, and then it's just what you do for fun. Um, I decided, Alan, to make you a video to watch instead of asking you to come Monday. When I heard Cumberland County schools are out, I thought they just approach, you're not gonna wanna come. So the reason I was here last night until 7.30 was I was making you a video to watch for, for Monday. We still need to cover this. This is something we do a lot in calculus. But here's the link to the video that I made last night. Watch it and then try that homework that I wrote. Tonight's homework is, well, it's on several places, but this sheet is one of them. If you need to review logarithms, then look at that packet I gave you and that link that I gave you. Watch the logarithmic videos and redo that sheet I gave you yesterday. And then finally, Monday, you can do trig equations. It's a lot to ask, but y'all are remediating weaknesses and y'all are gonna be my strongest folks in calculus because of this review, I know you are. All right, have a good weekend. I'll see you Tuesday. Actually, Mr. Grease will see you Tuesday. I'll be in here. Oh, All right, so let me Yes. Yes, me. That's not
Okay. Expanding. Yay! Yay! Bless so, you. Just for, for example, number 21, I just want you to know if I did that correctly. You said to take apart the quotient of two logs as the difference of two, or the log of a quotient as the difference of two logs, and then you said take apart the product as the sum of two logs, and then you said, I know it's legal to bring the exponent out front. That's beautiful. And on that logarithm packet that I gave you, um, it has the answers to those, so you can check them off. All righty, you're welcome. I'm so proud of you for doing that last night. Yes. Um, I have a question. Yes, sir. I know that there's different types of calculus. Yes. I was wondering what this course actually was. Okay, glad you asked.